Several months ago, uh, I had a young friend uh, who was having a personal revival in her life, which was something we were very thankful for. And she was starting uh, to do her own devotions. And she was asking Dr. Kathy and I about suggestions on how to do that. And uh, she asked me just, you know, so, so what are you reading in the Bible these days? And I told her, well, I've been reading the book of uh, Deuteronomy. And uh, she said, well, that's kind of random, um, that, that word that you all like to use. Uh, and uh, she said, so why are you reading the book of Deuteronomy? And I was very happy to tell her, like so many of you know, that when Jesus faced Satan in the wilderness, uh, that's where he got all his answers from. Jesus had 39 books in the Old Testament to uh, choose from, and he chose all his answers from the book of Deuteronomy. And I thought, I need to read that book. I've read it before, uh, but you know, I read it again, and, and I went through it, and then I went back over to the beginning and started reading. And I've been getting just a tremendous blessing out of that book, and I want to share just some of the things that I have with you this evening. This is just from like the first 12 chapters. And going through the book of Deuteronomy, um, there's cer certain themes that come out, all right? Um, the first theme that really jumped out at me was the importance of the law of God, the importance of following God's instructions. Now, the word Deuteronomy means the second reading of the law, okay? It's the second legislation. That's the translation of the Greek name. Uh, and as you go through the book, you see over and over again Moses, or God through Moses, telling uh, the children of Israel that they need to follow God's instructions. They need to keep them. Just for, just for an example, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and judgments which I teach you, to do them that you may live, and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. That's Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak to your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep them and do them. And I'm going to jump to chapter 8, verse 1, Deuteronomy. Glad some of you have your Bibles. We'll be in Deuteronomy. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1 says, all the commandments which I command you this day, observe to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Now, chapter 6 really seems to pull it all together. And the, the instruction that God gives, his commandments. Okay, So going to chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 1, reading 1 through 3, it said, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you may do them in the land where you go to possess it, that you might fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes, his commandments, that I command you, you and your son, your son's son, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may increase mightily as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you in the land that flows with milk and honey. God wants to take his children into a land that flows with milk and honey. And he wants them to prosper. He wants them to multiply. He wants them to do well. And so he gives them these commandments, these laws, and encourages them to keep them. Going to the last two verses of Deuteronomy, in verses 24 and 25, there we read, The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Um, Moses, God for Moses, giving them instruction to keep his commandments, keep his laws, keep his instructions. And when you come here to start school, we encourage you to keep the rules, you know, because they are made with the desire to help all of us have a better life here, a better year, to do well, to succeed. That's the purpose of the rules. Those are the purpose of the rules that God gave Moses to give to Israel. Um, that's the big theme in Deuteronomy. The next theme is that Israel doesn't do it. 
Does that sound familiar? I hope not. Um, they're going to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor, the Lord thy God has destroyed them from among you. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 8, also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. Horeb is another name for Sinai, so it's talking about the golden calf incident. And in Deuteronomy 9, 22, it says, And at Tabera, and at Massa, and at Kibru Thahathava, you provoked the Lord to, grab, to wrath. And so we have this second theme and these repetitions of times that they disobeyed God. The children of Israel did not do what God wanted them to do so that they could be blessed. Um, there's a passage that really sums it up in the ninth chapter of Deuteronomy, starting with verse 4. Verse 4, Deuteronomy 9, verse 4, it says, Speak not in your heart. Don't say to yourself that the, after the Lord your God has cast out the nations that you're going into this place there in the land of Canaan. After the Lord has cast them out before you, don't say to yourself, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord does drive them out before you. Verse 5, 9 verse 5, not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart do you go in to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord God does drive them out before you, and that he may perform the word which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, a third time, three verses, and he repeats it because he really wants them to get this. The Lord your God gives you not this good land to possess it, for your righteousness. And then the clincher, you're a stiff-necked people. And I think that can speak to us today. Um, so not for their righteousness. So, so that's the second theme. We got the theme of the commandments, the instructions that God gives them. And we have the theme that Israel doesn't follow God's instructions. Then there's a third theme. This is all in the first 12 chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. There's a third theme. And that third theme is, um, and I'll introduce it with a question. If it's not for their righteousness, on what basis is God going to bring Israel into the land of Canaan? And these speak to us. Because in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says that these things were done to them for an example and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So we're to learn from what happened to Israel. So if not for their righteousness, on what basis is God going to bring them into the land of Canaan? Um, I found three, four things. You could say three, four, you'll see what I mean. Okay, looking here at the book of Deuteronomy. So going to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 37. It says there, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them and brought thee out in his sight with his mighty power out of Egypt to drive out nations from before thee, greater and mightier than thou art, to bring thee, to give thee their land for an inheritance as it is this day. The first reason I found is because he loved their fathers. He loved Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. And that's why he's going to treat the children the way he is. He's going to be merciful to them. Even though they're a stiff-necked people, he's bringing them in because he loved their fathers. And that's an encouragement to us who are parents. You know, some of us are concerned about our children. And God loves us. And he's going to take care of our children for us. Okay, so that's one reason. And then a second reason, if you go on to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. And there we actually have two reasons that are given, but I'm just going to concentrate on one. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than my people, but you, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. And so now, not just that he loved their fathers, the Lord loves them. Amen. 
and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So the other reasons that he, he brings them out is because he loves them. And you can wonder, how can he love these people who keep rebelling against him and murmuring and going after other gods and just doing what he doesn't want them to do? And when I'll, the best I can tell you here in a, just a minute is that when you get to be parents, you'll understand. Regardless of what your children do, you love them. So God loves their fathers, and he loves the, loves the children. He loves them. And there's another thing that's mentioned there that's very interesting, and that is because of an oath that he swore. So what was that oath? Well, that's what we find uh, here. We're leaving Deuteronomy and going over to Genesis 22. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy. But in Genesis 22 there, verses 17 and 18, I'm going to read from verse 15. The angel of the Lord called out to Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So notice what God said in, in it's actually not here on the slide, but in verse 16. By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, you have done this thing. By myself have I sworn that in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we know that's the promise of Jesus, the Redeemer. Okay, so that's the second reason, because he swore an oath uh, to them. It's a very interesting thing that Paul does in Hebrews verse, chapter 6, verse 17. And uh, here, this is the New Living Translation, which I just think really sums it up. Paul looks at that oath that God swears to Abraham. And he says, God also bound himself with an oath. Now, that's something to think about. You know, how did that happen? Uh, God put together the plan of redemption back in eternity with Jesus, right? Um, and I can see him saying there, you know, when these people, um, when they develop their civilization and their society and everything, taking oaths is going to be very important to them. It's going to make them feel that that's really the truth. So even though God never lies, he said, I'm going to swear an oath just so that they can trust what I say. He doesn't need to do that. He did it for us. And so in Hebrews 6, 17, Paul writes, God bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure he would never change his mind. And that's the promise of Jesus. So God, that's the second reason he took them in. And then the next reason uh, that he took them in is because of um, the wickedness of the nations there in Canaan. And that's a long subject, and I'm not going to spend time on that, but that's a really important study also. So that's his third reason. Okay? Um, it says in Deuteronomy 9, 5, Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart do you go in to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God does drive them out before you, that he may perform the word which he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they don't go in because of their righteousness. They go in because of God's love, because he swore an oath, and because of the wickedness of the nations. That's what Deuteronomy says. What should we learn from this? That's something to, to think about. Okay, so we're given reasons why Israel doesn't go in, and we're given reasons why they do go in. Now, if these things are written for our admonition, is, is there any more specific counsel that's directed to us from Israel's example? And here, at this point, I want to read something from Selected Messages. And this is 
probably a very familiar passage to you all. It's not what's up here. This is just to give you the context. Um, but this is Selected Messages, page 68 and 69. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaimed it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Dissensions and divisions came in. The majority opposed with voice and pen. The few who, following in the providence of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Many who should have devoted their time and talents to the one purpose of sounding warnings to the world were absorbed in opposing the Sabbath truth. And in turn, the labor of its advocates was necessarily spent in answering those opponents and defending the truth. Thus, the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. It was not God's will that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God's will was not done. God did not design that his people Israel should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of their of unbelief, Hebrews 3.19, so everything I'm reading to you, you can read in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred. He could not fulfill his covenant with them. Last paragraph. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. And that is why we are still here. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among God's professed people. Strife. That have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. First selected messages 68 and 69. So... We cannot enter Canaan based on our righteousness. We just read the indictments against us because we have no righteousness. All we have are strife, unconsecration, worldliness, unbelief, rebellion, murmuring, hatred, disunity. These are the words of God's messenger to the church today. Active opposition to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In other words, Unrighteousness. That's what we have. And the conditions for entering Canaan are God's love, the oath he swore, the wickedness of the nations, and the only thing left for us is the righteousness of Jesus. That's all that's left for us. We have nothing except the righteousness of Jesus. In Isaiah 61, we're familiar with the passage, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord because he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and covered me with the robe of righteousness. Uh, his righteousness is seen as a robe that we're covered with. Okay. Um, so question, a couple of questions as we come to the close. How do we get Christ's righteousness? You know, there's a couple of stories in the Bible about how to get his righteousness, and, and I haven't put it all together, so I'm just going to give it to you, and you can go home and pray about it and think about it. Uh, one story is found in Matthew 22, and you're all familiar with it, the, the wedding banquet, about this man who threw a feast, a marriage feast for his uh, son and invited all these people, but they wouldn't come. 
Uh, even some of them took his messengers and killed them or treated them badly. Uh, and he got mad at them and sent his armies and destroyed their cities and them. And then he told his servants, they wouldn't come, go out on the highways and byways and invite any who will come in to come to the wedding. And so they did. They went out and it it's sticks in my mind that they went and gathered all. They, they called both good and bad people who had no righteousness of their own. And they invited them. And they all came to the feast. But as the king went around the feast, he saw one individual who didn't have a wedding garment. And so the custom back then, when you invited people to your feast, like today, uh, you go to weddings and uh, the uh, bride and the bridegroom, they pay for your tuxedos and your bouquets and all that stuff. Well, the king supplied the wedding garment. And so there was no excuse for this man not to have a wedding garment. And that was the price of admission. That was the only way he could be in there. Then they threw him out. So... We need, that's one way to get the wedding garment. And that's free. But then you go to the message to the church of Laodicea. Okay? And there it says that uh, we are counseled to buy gold, white raiment, and isa. The white raiment is the wedding garment. And we're to buy that. Okay? And I think what that's talking about is that it's, it's without price. We're told that in Isaiah. But it's a price that everybody can pay. Everybody. Nobody has an advantage over anybody else. Because the price is the complete surrender of your heart. Complete. Jesus becomes Lord of your life. And then you get his righteousness. And that is how we get into the promised land. That is how our sins are done away with. With Christ's righteousness, not ours. With his righteousness. Um, Paul has some interesting statements uh, in Galatians 3.27. This is all, there's so much that can obviously be said about Christ's righteousness, but I want to just leave you with this. Uh, he says, as many as you have, have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. So that's kind of like the garment, right? It's something you put on. Okay? In Romans 13, 14, he says, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. Put on Christ's righteousness. Okay? So there's this young lady and she's got a day job as a fireman or a fire person or a firewoman. Or, you know. So when she's going to go fight fires, she puts on her firefighting suit. Okay? And then when she goes out in the evening or she goes to church, she puts on a dress. Okay? She, the type of clothes that she wears determine what she does. She's not going to put on a dress to go fight fires. Right? And she's not going to put on her fire suit to go to church or to go out. Okay? So what you put on will determine what you do. And you know, I thought about that. And so I thought, what I need to do every morning, and this is what I want to invite all of you to do, every morning, pray to God. Say, Lord, I want the righteousness of your son. I want it. You take what, I give you everything for it. Everything. You take whatever you want of my life. I want his righteousness. Then believe he gives it to you. And then the next thing you do is, Lord, I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put it on. And put it on. And when you go out of your door, remember you got on his righteousness. Remember that you got on his righteousness. Um, just, this is the last slide. There's one more thing in the book of Deuteronomy. With all that, God's going to bring them in. Not because they're righteous, but because his son is righteous. He's going to bring them into the promised land. He's going to bring us into the promised land. But before that, in Deuteronomy 4, there's this passage 
that seems very important. Deuteronomy 4, verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5 says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them. Do the statutes and judgments and the commandments. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so near to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? With the righteousness of Jesus, we'll be able to live that law. With his righteousness, not anything else, just with his righteousness. Is it that God and the world are waiting for a wise and understanding nation? A nation that has statutes and judgments so righteous as this law? A nation whose God is so near to them, as God is in all things that we call upon him for? A nation that keeps the commandments of God and has the faith of Jesus? Is that what we are all waiting for? May it come soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for what you have done. For Jesus who died for us and lived for us to make it possible for us to fulfill your plans for us, to to cooperate with you in your will being done and your kingdom coming. Father, we, we accept the righteousness of Jesus. We give you everything that you want, that everything that is in us. We give it to you. And we pray that this righteousness will do its work in us. Be with us as we go through the rest of this evening. Keep everyone safe. May everyone have a good rest. And may we continue preparing for the work you have for us. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us for our prayer meeting. Feel free to continue praying wherever you may be because we believe that prayer changes things. If you've been blessed by our program, why not leave a special prayer request or praise report in the comments below and we'll be sure to share it with our prayer team. May God be with you.